All right, so uh, this is uh, How to Find Valuable Gems. I'm Daniel Bidler. Um, I work for a company called Envy Labs. Uh, one of our products, especially if you've been in the beginner track today, is Code School, uh, where we do training, browser based training for Ruby, JavaScript, Friend, all that other stuff. Um, I also do something called Ruby 5, again with Envy Labs, which is a five minute, twice a week podcast. Uh, do it with Greg Pollock and a handful of other people. Has anybody heard of Envy Labs? I'm curious. Code School? Ruby 5. Yeah. Progressively less. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, so the reason I bring up Ruby 5, um, I'll kind of come back on again during this talk. Uh, but I would encourage you if there, if you are interested, there's a subscribe button for iTunes and RSS. Uh, again, we'll kind of circle back on why I think that's important. So this is the beginner track. Um, so I'm kind of tailoring this more toward an entry level. Um, so I thought I would kind of start with uh, maybe gem benefits. Does anybody here not know what a gem is, what Ruby gems is? So I'm not to start there, right? Okay. Um, so I guess brief overview since we're all there. Somebody else is writing code for you, and that's great, right? That's it means I don't have to, I don't have to pay for it, spend my time on it, whatever. Um, so, now that we've kind of said that, um, the main focus of this talk is, is really finding and evaluating gems, right? Uh, the finding part, I think by and large, once you recognize the shortcomings is somewhat simple, although we'll touch on some of those. Um, I primarily want to focus on what I do to evaluate gems, because I think that's interesting and uh, different and valuable, basically. You guys are certainly welcome. This is a small audience, so if you disagree or have questions along the way, let me know. I'm good with that. Feedback is good. Quiet, not so good. Um, all right, so finding gems. Uh, <laughs> Ruby gems, since everybody here knows what it is, um, obviously at this point, it's hosted on rubygems.org. Um, if I remember correctly, this was a Nick Caranto push a while ago. Um, so rubygems.org, uh, what's on there? Right now, there's somewhere around 38,000 gems. Uh, so by and large, anything that you might think you need to do has probably been done to some level. If it's isolatable, small piece, whatever, even larger. Um, these are generally free and open source uh, by nature of rubygems. It is kind of open source at some level regardless of if it's on GitHub or not. Um, so I kind of wanted to start you guys with an example because I want to point out one of the flaws, I guess, of Ruby gems. And that is, let's say for example, does everybody know, have some idea of testing in Rails? But, and people know what acceptance testing is to some degree, which is more like a, I'm telling you what this thing's going to do, you agree, we agree, everybody's happy. Uh, so if you were going to do acceptance testing in Rails, does anybody have any ideas what you would do? Any gems come to mind? Anybody? Cucumber. Cucumber, all right. <laughs> so, gem install cucumber, right? Then maybe let's say you don't like cucumber. You could try a different flavor like uh, turnip. You could go further down that list and try spinach. If you want something that's a little bit more meaty, you could go further and have a steak. Uh, if you want the <laughs> best cut, some people would say, you might go for the filet. <laughs> or if all of that makes no sense at all, you might just have some sake. So this is actually um, kind of to highlight the issue, and that is the way Ruby gems are set up, gem names are unique, globally unique. Um, and as a beginner, it's basically impossible to know what gem you're looking for, right? So in this case, we said we want acceptance testing. And some guys in the back that obviously have done this before shouted Cucumber, right? And we went down this chain, and all of these are actually acceptance testing libraries. Now that they're all together, you can kind of see they're named based on each other. I know it's a play on words in some way, but really as a, as a new person to the community or the environment, there's no way to know that, right? Like, I don't actually expect any of you to have said Cucumber to start this. So, how do you actually go about 
determining what gems are available, what's new, what's popular, uh, what you should use in your project, right? So the first thing I would say is uh, news and feeds, right? Uh, the community has a lot of news sources. As I mentioned earlier, Ruby 5, for example, is put on by us. Uh, there's also Ruby Rogues, Ruby Inside, Ruby Flow, Ruby Reddit, a million other things out there, right? Um, Twitter. Um, and what's really nice about a lot of these sources is not only are they attempting to stay current about what's out there and what's going on, but they also have archives. So in theory, you can go to some of these places and kind of search the history to see what's out there. And again, this is because of poor naming, poor descriptions and things on RubyGems themselves. So the biggest problem here though, especially as a beginner and as an entry level person is this takes a lot of time, right? Like, you know, just Envy Labs, we put out a five minute podcast twice a week. Do I expect everybody in this room to listen to us rant for 10 minutes a week? No. Like, I don't think that's realistic, right? You might, and we appreciate it if you do, but, but I don't think that's realistic. And, and most people are just focused on how do I get my job done, right, at the end of the day. So like, I've got this problem, I need to get my job done. Uh, so you might think, okay, well, you know, I'm gonna go to RubyGems, which is the source. They are the canonical location, the distribution point, whatever you wanna call it. Uh, and I'm just gonna search on there because I saw they've got a little search button, right? So I've got an example here I, I wanted to point out, which is uh, if you go to RubyGems and you search for authentication, for example, like I wanna have a user system in my application, right? Search for authentication seems realistic. So these are all 30 results that come up. They're, obviously, they're off the page. Nowhere on there do you see device, which is arguably the most popular, most used gem. There is reference to it in one description of one gem that has nothing to do with it. Uh, number three on here is RESTful authentication at 116. And if you actually look at the repository for it on GitHub, the last commit was two years ago with a commit message of Booyah. So, you know, like, it makes you kind of question that as a, as a methodology of finding your gems, right? Uh, for, for some of the older people in the community, which arguably might not be many in here, three further down from that is this one, which is Merbful Authentication. And the description is uh, a port of Rick Olson's RESTful Authentication, which is this, for Merv, which is a framework that basically no longer exists, right? So, searching rubygems.org uh, isn't terribly useful. And some of that is because the RubyGem spec doesn't have a built-in self-categorization. Like, you can't say, I'm going to release Cucumber and it is in the test-in category, or however else you want. I think it's just not currently a piece of the puzzle, right? So where else would you search? More than likely, you would be going to Google, right? It's where everybody goes for everything. So what do you look for at that point? You know, you'd look for blog posts, you'd look for example code gists, Rails casts, uh, Stack Exchange, all actually really good resources. And I would, I would actually suggest that if you do go to Google to search for something, you'll notice in the left-hand sidebar, there's a little thing that says uh, customize the search, I think, or filter the search. And if you hit it, you can say like, within the last month, within the last year, right? And that, that alone fixes the rubygems.org problem. Right, about two year old, two year old yeah, commit. Um, and ultimately, since uh, you know the issue here is we're trying to find things we really don't know anything about. We have some concept of you know we need to do testing. How do we go about testing? Uh, gem Ruby gem for testing, right? So you you kind of have this idea of a category or a group of things you're looking for. So there's actually a resource out there that I've heard uh, mentioned in a few different talks at this point briefly, and that's the Ruby Toolbox. And I would really suggest this to especially beginners. Um, the Ruby Toolbox was created by a uh, guy named Christoph Bolzauka? Bolzauka? Bolzauka. <laughs> um, and he actually launched it and released it like a day or two before RailsConf in 2009. So this resource is basically about three years old at this point, almost to the day. Yeah. Um, Ruby Toolbox is community driven. It is basically a categorization endpoint. Does anybody have any questions at this point? Yeah. You mentioned Stack Exchange. Uh, are you referring to you have a Stack Overflow or the other Stack Exchange sites to vote as Yeah, uh, you know, and Stack Overflow probably. Yeah. 
What was that? Question, sorry. Oh, he, he said I mentioned the stack exchange thing. Was he, well, was I talking about stack overflow? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, I think there's a group of these stack-like things where people you know, post comments and responses. There isn't one like dedicated to gems. No, no, certainly not dedicated to gems. There are some that focus on Ruby. But, um, so the Ruby toolbox, uh, it's community-driven. Uh, they actually right now have somewhere around 160 categories of gems, right? Earlier, we were in there 38,000 gems currently on, on Ruby gems. So they've got 160 categories. Uh, they list the idea of a project, and that is a gem that has been assigned to a category. So they've got about 1,400 <coughs> projects. They do actually index to some degree or have concept of about 38,000 gems, which is basically all of them, uh, and 1,700 GitHub repos. So they do have reference and, and some idea or concept of a lot of pieces here. Um, and actually, I want to give you kind of an idea of what it looks like just because I want to highlight the difference between like kind of where we started and, and what this gives you. So here is actually, uh, if you went to Ruby, sorry, if you went to Ruby Toolbox um, and clicked on the Categories tab, you can actually get a list of all of their categories, right? So this is just a small snippet. snippet. So content management as a major category, you might say, I want to CMS, right? Which is actually relatively popular. So here you can see content management. They've got Refinery, Radiant, Locomotive, Avda, browser CMS, and 15 more, right? And if you actually look at any one of those, they will actually give you a ton of information uh, about the gem. They'll show you, if they know the GitHub repository, they'll show you the last commit date. There is kind of a score that's given to it by the Ruby toolbox. There, you know, they'll categorize or order it by their score. So basically a lot of the things that I'm gonna kind of continue to talk about when evaluating a gem, they've kind of built that. So it's a really nice resource, especially for beginners. Um, so now we kind of talk about how to find gems. Um, I've got, it looks like, 15 minutes. So I'm going to kind of move on to the evaluation <laughs> gem. I'm assuming either via Google, a GitHub search, some other means you have located a gem that you might want to use. So everybody kind of up to this point? Good. Any questions at this point? So what I'm going to say here is uh, kind of what I do in a lot of ways, or the, the ideas I think about when I'm evaluating a gem. So uh, your mileage may vary, obviously. I don't expect you to follow this as gospel, uh, but kind of think about it, basically. Uh, so the very first thing I want to mention is uh, when you're looking at a gem that you want to potentially use in your app, you should pay attention to how critical to your app that gem or library is. Right? If it's something that means my application is useless without it. Obviously, you need to be a lot more critical of what that <coughs> is and does and how it's implemented and who maintains it. Right? If it's something that's like, you know, this gives me a convenient way to add a Twitter button, it probably means a lot less. Right? Um, so, so that's kind of where I want to start. Is I think that's that's useful to have in your head when you actually start looking for these gems. Like, how important to it? How important to me is it that this gem works correctly? and doesn't somehow break my code in some other way. Um, this next thing is actually uh, kind of from Yehuda, and that is uh, people use, there are a lot of gems out there, 38,000 gems, right? And they go from C full CMS systems to, you know, help me put a Twitter button on the page, to give me a list of states in the United States. Like, so you need to weigh to some degree the usefulness of a gem. So like if you're looking for a gem to give you the 50 states in the United States, that's probably not a great use of a gem. And the reason for that is whenever you pull a gem into your application, you're building in dependencies, right? You're building, you're pulling it out of people's code that you have to be somewhat concerned about, and if you are the developer, you are now somewhat responsible for it in somebody else's eyes, right? So, so you kind of want to weigh how useful a, a gem is to uh, whether or not you should even use it or implement it yourself, basically. In the case of 50 United States, it, 50 states in the United States, it would probably be easier to you, for you to just copy. I mean, you could just copy and paste their YAML file, for example, if they've got a list, copy it. You don't have to depend on it, right? Nothing's stopping us from that. So now that we've got those two out of the way, I, you know, I'm going to talk about the actual gems themselves. Uh, so the very first thing I talk about, and this is both with regard to me pulling a gem into my application and us covering gems on Ruby 5, for example. Uh, the very first thing we look for is documentation. And there's a lot of reasons for that. 
but I think ultimately it can boil down to a very simple question, and that is, does the author or maintainer care about you? Right? Have they taken the time to try to see how somebody else using their software is going to use their software? Have they thought about what my position is when I come to them, basically? Right? And that's really telling, actually. Because if somebody has, has sat down and thought about my experience, it's somewhat safe to assume they've thought about my experience when they wrote the code itself. Right? And that's huge. Because at the end of the day, I don't want to have to learn 17 different ways to do a million different things. It would be really nice if they made it really simple and said, this is the interface, this is why it's nice, this is why you should use it, this is why it's better than something else. Here's an example. Right? That's awesome. And that means a lot. So once you've got the documentation, the next thing is the source. I don't think it's absolutely necessary, but if you can get access to the source, great. I mean, pretty much all gems right now are free and open source. I would say almost all of them are on GitHub, which is awesome. Um, once you have access to the source, you want to skim through it, at the very least. Um, is it clear? Is it understandable? Does, you know, did they do same things? Um, and at the end of the day, is it safe? Because, you know, when you use a Ruby gem and you include it in your application, we're in Ruby. People can override object. Like, you know, you could, you could override object to us and they could do whatever you want. So it's nice to at least kind of blow through the code and say, are they doing anything obviously stupid here? Do I see a network connection going to a third party service I have no clue why they would do? Right? So far I haven't actually seen people exploit that, but it's possible. Right? And at the end of the day, I'm responsible for it, so it's worth looking at. And while you have the source open, actually, the next step that I would really suggest is, is look at the dependencies. Because, you know, just because I'm requiring a gem, that gem can actually be dependent on 10, 15, 30 other things. So if I'm taking the time to actually investigate a gem for an application and it's now dependent on 10 other things, in theory, I should now be looking at all 10 of those other things, right? The idea is basically you're marrying the entire family. So, you know, you want to know your in-laws. Right? Uh, so here's kind of a, an example. This isn't huge, so this is a screenshot taken from RubyGems itself. When you view a gem on RubyGems, they kind of parse through the gem spec and, and help you get quick links to the source if it's listed, the uh, uh, homepage if it's listed, things like that. And at the bottom, they, they will kind of interpret the gem spec for you and show you Runtime uh, dependencies versus development dependencies. Do people know the difference? Do you guys have any questions as far as the difference between runtime and development dependencies? No, can you explain? Sure. So um, when you load a gem into a production application, you, you basically just do a standard gem install. All it looks for is the runtime dependencies. So in the case of, uh, let's say, a CMS that is intended to be built on Rails, they will most likely have a dependency on Rails. So if I did a gem install foo CMS, it would install foo CMS and Rails and all of Rails dependencies for me if I don't have them already. Right? Uh, Ruby Gems has an idea of development dependencies, which really hasn't been used greatly in the community. Some people do them, some people don't. The idea there is you can actually do a gem install, I think, dash dash dev or dash dash development in the name and it will install the runtime dependencies and the development dependencies. And the idea there is that you're going to be doing development locally for it. So like maybe I want to add a new feature to RSpec. In theory, I could gem install dev RSpec, and it would give me all the dependencies so I could do that. But in reality, it doesn't happen. Right? So really all you pay attention to is the runtime dependencies at this point. Um, is that clear? Yeah. Um, so in this case, this isn't terrible. If I glance down this list, active support is huge. If you've used Rails, you've used Active Support, right? It's part of Rails Core. So that one doesn't concern me. For example, Builder also doesn't concern me because it was also is a dependency of, of Rails. IE2N is, is Rails. JSON is Rails kind of at this point. So the only two real questions there, once you've done this a few times, is okay, what does money do and what does Active Utils do, right? At which point I might kind of glance through them and see either how this gem uses it or what those gems look like, right? Because again, this is code that's going into my system. They may have namespaces that collide with things I use, right? There's, there's a lot of issues, potentially, that could arise here. Uh, speaking of issues, the next thing I look at, generally, if it's on GitHub, are there issues? Um, and it's not looking for 
are all of their issues taken care of? Because that's never going to happen, right? If it's, a, if it's a good, popular project, it should have a community around it, and people should be, at the very least, posting feature requests. So, you know, you look for their, you look through the, the issue list and you, you know, skim for significant problems, like, this broke Rails 3. That's probably significant, if it's still open, right? And it's good to know that. <coughs> Um, and what I actually like to do, which is a little bit different from that, is on GitHub, uh, they actually have two different tabs, and I know this is really small, but on GitHub, if you go to GitHub, GitHub issues, they've got a tab for open issues and a tab for closed issues. And on this particular project, there were 18 open issues, in theory none of which are show-stopping, 128 closed issues. So I actually pay attention to that ratio, because I like to get a sense of how active the maintainers are. Right? They're, Here's my next example. 45 open issues, 13 closed issues. That's significantly more concerning to me, right? Assuming that those are somewhat useful issues. At the very least, I'd like to see activity on it, right? Uh, so further onto this chain, on the same GitHub page, they've got a display of watchers and forks, right? So in this case, this particular project has got 45 issues has 1,800 watchers, so people care about the project, in theory. 603 forks. The only time people fork things is when they need to fix it, really, or feature request it or something. If there's 45 open issues, 13 closed, and 600 forks, that's really scary, right? Like, that's not somebody I want to marry. Yeah? I had a situation recently where I was looking at the gem, and there's a lot of issues with it, but I found a fork that fixed a lot of those issues. Like, if you're trying to fix an obscure issue, how far deep would you go down that rabbit hole? If you are trying to fix an issue? Well, if you identify the so, issue. So you're, you're, you're using fork. a major gem, you realize there's a problem with it, you find a fork of that gem that in theory fixes it based on the commit messages, I'm guessing. Um, it was a commit message. Right. Um, <laughs> so I would say be careful there, certainly. Um, Depending your, prod, depending your application, especially production application, on a fork is dangerous in a lot of ways because they are not the main maintainer. So the likelihood of them continuing to maintain that fork is very low. If they haven't opened a pull request upstream to try to get merged and are actively petitioning to get it merged, it's going to die, right? Because the main line is just going to keep going if it's an active project. So, you know, I think there are instances where you can, you know, this is a little beyond scope, but you could, you know, put a git ref in your in your gem file and say, I want this particular thing, knowing that, you know, three weeks from now or four months from now or six months from now, the person behind me isn't going to know why I did that, right? Yeah. And so you need to be very clear, well, whether it's a, com a comment on why you did it or a link to an open issue, right? So that somebody behind you knows why you're doing it. I think that's important. Um, this is arguably minor, um, but I take versioning seriously. There's an idea out there called semantic versioning. Does everybody know what semantic versioning is? Anybody doesn't, <coughs> hasn't heard of semantic versioning? No, uh, a couple. So uh, there's a the URL here, semver.org. It's really a, you know, basically codifying what it means to, what version numbers mean. It's basically saying if you're a library author, your version numbers should be at a minimum composed of three numbers, major, minor, patch and they mean something. Like, you, you only rotate a major release if it's backward incompatible. And if anything you release ever is backward incompatible, it's a major release. Even if you feel like it was a bug fix, but the way you fixed it changed your public API, the way somebody would interact with your library, it's a major release, period. And, and the reason for that is, is actually this, which is a pessimistic lock, or there's a million names for it, some of which are Probably not repeatable. Um, pessimistic lock is really your friend at the end of the day, but only if authors actually respect it. Does anybody here not know what a pessimistic lock is? Probably good at you. Uh, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll get there. I'm curious. So has everybody heard of it? Everybody kind of knows. Some? I mentioned it yesterday in my talk. I can. I actually had to repeat it. Please repeat it. <laughs> Please repeat it. All right. So uh, let's say you found a gem 
that uses semantic versioning, the way you should put that into your bundle, your gem file, is basically uh, like this. So gem, super fantastic. Um, I'm gonna use the pessimistic lock at 2.1 for this example. So in theory, you know, you found a gem you love, the current version is maybe 2.1. And you happen to know that they follow semantic versioning, most gems that do mention it in their readings somewhere because it's useful information. Um, so I might pessimistic lock to 2.1. 2.1 is the current. What most people would historically do is greater than or equal to 2.1, which is very, very, very dangerous. Um, to do a pessimistic lock is only useful against the Sember gem. Because in theory, the major release is going to change if it's backward incompatible. So as long as they follow semantic versioning, this should never explode, right? If I write my application and say it's pessimistically locked to 2.1, I build my API into it, that you know my application's great, doing a bundle update shouldn't make my application explode, in theory. So uh, a quick example, uh, if I said, uh, pessimistic lock is 2.1, and the current release, this is obviously contrived, is 1.0, will that get installed into my application? Does anybody think that will get installed? No, good. All right, uh, next example, 2.0. So let's say I do a bundle update, and for whatever reason, Bundler says that the highest number that you can get is 2.0. Does that meet the criteria? No, and that does not because it's greater than dot one, right, so it's 2.1. So let's say Bundler contacts RubyGems, RubyGems says, hey, the current version is 2.1. Is that gonna get included? Yes, yes it will, right? So tomorrow they re realize 2.1 has a bug in it. So you know, an hour later they release 2.1.1, right? Is that gonna get included? Yes. Yes, all right. Then they go a dot further for some reason, right? <laughs> is that gonna get included? Yes, good. 2.2 comes out. Do I get it? Yeah. Yes. 3.0 comes out. Do I get it? No. no, I don't. So what is pessimistic lock? How does it work? Does anybody have any questions about this? I heard some no's in the 2.2. The I, I was looking for an equals for the 2.1. So that was a greater than. Versus right. So. The way pessimistic lock works, the easiest way to think about it is however deep you make your version number, just put your finger over the last dot and number, and that's what you're bound to, right? So like if I did a pessimistic lock at 2.1.1, then I wouldn't get 2.2, because that final dot one is variable, but the patch level dot one is not. So what it does is it, it looks at how specific you are and goes one level up. Right? So in this case, I'm binding myself to the 2.x release. If I said 2.1.x, then I'm bound to 2.1, which, again, if they're following Sember, isn't useful. It's only major releases in theory that are not backward compatible. Okay. that good? So at the end of the day, all of this comes down to uh, curation. You know, does, from all of the available information you have about a gem, do you feel like the maintainer cares about you? Based on the issues, based on their responses to things, do you feel like they care about their code? Do you think they care about you? Right? That's ultimately kind of what it boils down to. Does anybody have any questions to this point? I know my time is basically up, so I can cut it here if you need, or questions? Yeah. yeah. How do you make the decision about whether you want to copy, copy code or integrated existing gem. So my general feeling is uh, based on the complexity. So like in the case of somebody made an action view helper that lets me put a Twitter button on the page, like that's not hugely useful to me. That's something I can do in five minutes. So is it worth the dependency? No. Um, you know, I, I would generally cut it at about a half a day to a day of work. And I would also, to some degree, look at what is the potential variability on it. Like, is this data going to change? Is something about this library, do I anticipate it changing regularly? And am I willing to take on the responsibility for keeping it up to date? Right, because that does kind of weigh on it. Like if you're, you know, I, I made an example earlier of uh, states. I don't, I don't see the states changing anytime soon. And if I do, I'm sure I know about it, right? 
<laughs> but countries, countries change fairly regularly. So maybe, you know. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yeah. The whole um, concept of the gem and it being independent versus part of the actual rails default, mm -hmm. um, do you have any insight into how that occurs and that decision making happens? Insight into why, so why Rails isn't just one gem? And no, yeah. it, it makes decisions for defaults. The, the, core, oh. the core team does, right? And I, I would imagine right. it's political. Or yeah, it's absolutely. So the question was, uh, how do the default gems in Rails become the default gems to some degree? And it's entirely political. Right? It's entirely political, but I'm just in, interested in it from that communicates it, um, what I want to invest my time in, perhaps, because it, it, it flags um, all these things they talk about this criteria now with evaluating gem of what I'm willing to invest my time in and moving forward with. Uh, it, from committing to a test framework, it could be right. conducting our spec or whatever. It, it just it influences, it seems, a lot. Sure. So, if Rails blesses your gem as a default for Rails, obviously the Rails core team is in some ways vouching for you, right? But it's not a decision they take lightly. It's not like, I released a gem yesterday, it's now a default in Rails. Like, that's not never going to happen, right? Yeah. So, you know, at that point, when something is a default for Rails, you know, you can kind of assume that a lot of this evaluation has occurred. In, in almost all cases, in pretty much all cases, there's also been time behind it, right? And they haven't had any major screw-ups enough to concern the core team to shy them away from making a million people install it, right? So I think you know the, the traditional example there would be like our spec versus test unit, right? So you know by default Rails is test unit oriented, um, and there's a flag that you can tell it to you know I want to install for Rails instead using a template or Rails or using our spec instead. Um, you know, ultimately that is a political decision. Um, the core team do, I mean this is all other so I'll try to be quick, but uh, the core team do care. They do look at gems fairly regularly. They do listen when the community starts to push like for, we want our spec, whatever. Um, you know, there are very strong opinions in the core team that our spec isn't good for Ruby. Um, and there are opinions the opposite way. Um, so they made it interchangeable. Right. Which is generally what happens. For most defaults, there is an API now for whatever that default gem is, so you could swap something else. Okay. Anybody else? Big questions, little questions, completely off topic questions. Yeah? How, how do you know a gem is, you know, if the author of a gem says, I'm not going to maintain this anymore? Is that just a little bit? Um, so the question was, how do you know if a maintainer is just going to drop maintenance for gen? You don't. Um, you know, you judge on track record. So, for example, you would look at a gem and see how many version releases they've had and how long the time. Um, you would look to see how active they are currently on fixing issues. You would look potentially at the commit history if it's a GitHub repo and see if they committed in the last week or last day or if it was two years ago. Right? Obviously, they're good enough. Um, which isn't a bad thing. Um, and a lot of times, the more popular gems, when the, the author knows the popular gem, will petition for a new maintainer. Whether it's through the README or through blog post or something else, they will start trying to find somebody else to take over before it's just outright dropping. Most people are good enough about not doing that. But the nice part of the internet is it's there forever, right? So at the very least, you've got the last release. And if, if it's critical to your application, I mean, like I said, you're marrying it. Right? If, you're, if you're investing time and money into tying into somebody else's code, you're marrying it. This is open source currently, so you know if they disappeared tomorrow, you still have the last thing they did, the last thing they released. You know, now it's a business decision on your end as to can we afford to maintain this. You know, obviously, it's business critical to us or we would have done it. So is it still, is there another option at that point? Can we swap it out realistically, or do we need on the pizza in terms of maintaining? Anybody else? Good. So I've got a uh, you know a couple favorite gems. I know I'm a little bit over time. Our spec I think is great. David Shkorsky is an awesome curator. He's very good at saying no. He's very good at 
pointing a direction. Um, whether or not you like our spec, I think he's he's a, a great example of a maintainer. Yeah. Since I'm developing a little tutorial, there have been times where I run into a problem with our spec and I posted you know, the bug. And, and, and David is the one that responds to you in five minutes, right? It. It's yeah. like a fun movie. The same is actually true of VCR. Um, awesome support by the maintainer behind that. And actually, I want to point out finally Faraday. I know Faraday is a little bit obscure, especially for the beginner track. But I wanted to point out, it's not even the maintainer in this point why I, I, it's one of my favorite gems. It's actually um, a auxiliary committer who is Mislov. He is an incredible maintainer, even of other people's gems. Like, he is entirely willing to just say no to features and, and tell you, you know, answer your question if you have it or tell you why you're doing something wrong or whatever else that you like. That stuff you really only learn over time, but you know, I just kind of want to mention it. So unless you guys have any other questions, I think there's a break right now, so.